Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, where we left off last week was uh, pretty much looking at the anatomy of the universe at the highest level. We saw it was basically a structure of, um, of galaxies, not only galaxies, but clusters of galaxies, super clusters of galaxies, which form these filaments and great walls of super clusters of galaxies uh, interspersed with these enormous voids in between. So we could think of that kind of as the anatomy of the, uh, of, of the universe in the large, kind of going back to that uh, bio biology uh, simile that we were talking about. This week, I'd like to look at the universe in the very, very small, maybe pushing the analogy a little bit, talking about the physiology of the universe. What makes up its smallest pieces and therefore how does it, the processes, how does it actually work? And if we were back in the 60s and we asked that question, the answer would be pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the universe is made up of matter and energy, essentially equivalent from E is equal to MC squared, uh, well known. Um, and the matter of the universe would be essentially the periodic table. Those are the, uh, that's the matter that we know. Uh, the, the elements, um, uh, the atoms uh, make up uh, the matter of the universe. And if you wanted to dig a little deeper, certainly well known from our chemistry class in high school would be that uh, the atoms are made up of electrons, neutrons, and protons. And if you were up to date in the 60s with your research, you would know that the protons and neutrons were made up of quarks. And that was the story of, of, of the matter of the universe, all the matter that we knew. And as far as the energy was concerned, well, the energy was the energy, first of all, contained in that matter. Uh, there's the kinetic energy uh, of, the, of the matter, and there's the energy of configuration of the matter called potential energy. Um, and uh, also the energy that matter can produce, which by and large is radiation energy, the photons of light of various, every kind of wavelength, all the way from radio waves up to gamma waves. And that would be the answer to, to the question of what is the matter uh, and the energy of the universe. It would be, say, the atoms made up and the, and the by and large, the, the, the photons of, of radiation energy. Turns out that that's not the case. <laughs> it turns out that now in 2020, we know that that matter and energy that I just described, that we have spent our entire history of science studying, uh, is 5% of the matter and energy of the universe, 5%, which is astounding, was, certainly ranks as one of the greatest, that fact and its subsequent understanding of that and what's missing certainly ranks as one of the, the greatest set of uh, discoveries ever in the history of science. And that's what we want to talk about today and next week. Today we want to talk about the matter of the universe and find out that the matter that we know and love of atoms, of electrons and protons and neutrons, um, make up about 15% of the matter of the universe. And the other 85% is something called dark matter. Five times as much dark matter as there is all of the other matter that we know about. That is the matter of the stars and possibly even planets going around stars and black holes and the vast amounts of gas that we find uh, in dispersed in the galaxies, and very importantly, the tremendous amounts of hydrogen gas that's found in between the galaxies and the galaxy clusters. All of that matter represents 15% uh, of all the matter of the universe. And I want to present the evidence for that, that startling fact. Okay. It begins, our story begins in the, in the 1930s with an astronomer from uh, Caltech called the name of Fred Zwicky. And he was studying one of our favorite uh, uh, structures, the coma culture. The coma uh, cluster, as we remember, is, uh, is, the, is the super cluster down the road from us, from our, our Virgo super cluster. And he was studying the motion of the galaxies inside the coma cluster, not the stars in the coma cluster, couldn't resolve those, but he could resolve, certainly look at the motion of the galaxies in this enormous coma culture. 
And he found something very interesting as he looked at the speeds of the galaxies. Remember, he could do that by looking at the Doppler shift. Obviously, they don't move in the telescope or anything like that, anything nearly like that. Everything on the scale of astronomy is so slow that nothing really happens much in our lifetime except an occasional explosion here and there, which is very important. But uh, certainly the motion of these things is not visible. It's found in the Doppler shift. And in looking at the speeds of the galaxies, it was very strange. They were moving very quickly, so quickly that if you could think of the cluster as a gas, which is what physicists do to model uh, the motion of galaxies in the, in, in the cluster, he found that, the, that these galaxies actually were not stable gravitationally. They were moving so fast that the cluster should have dis dissipated long ago. That galaxies should have flown themselves out because there wasn't enough matter in the cluster to create enough gravitational field in the cluster to keep some of these very fast moving galaxies within that gravitational uh, entity. It's just a very strange discovery of how could that be? Why were these galaxies that were moving so fast still in the uh, coma cluster? Uh, and didn't know what to make of it. He said that there must be a gravitational uh, force that we don't see. The only thing that creates gravitational force is matter. And so he called it dark matter, uh, matter that could not be seen, that was uh, creating this phenomena in the coma cluster. And the name stuck, and uh, we still use it uh, today. He continued in his study of the coma cluster, and he was looking at what's called the mass to light ratio. Very simple idea. Uh, the sun has a mass to light ratio of one. You simply take the sun, you look at its mass, uh, has one solar mass, remember the number that we computed last week, two times 10 to the 30th kilograms, and you look at the luminosity of the sun. And you adjust the units, so we call those one, and so one over one is one. So the mass to light ratio of the sun is one. If you look at another star and you see that its mass to light ratio is two, for example, well, it would have twice as much mass uh, as, the, uh, as the sun does for the same amount of light. The ratio, if you found its, its mass with respect to the solar masses and its luminosity with respect to the luminosity of the sun, you would find that that ratio is not one to one, but two to one. It would have twice as much mass relative to, uh, to its light compared to the sun. And you can do this with stars, you can do this with galaxies. And it turns out that as the galaxies were, were, were studied, um, the mass to light ratio um, of stars and, 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 and galaxies were in a range from about one to 30. Yes, there were certainly many things which were heavier than the sun, greater mass than the sun, without you know its 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 accompanying uh, the, the luminosity, and so there was a range. But as Zwicky looked at the mass to light ratio of the coma cluster, again he calculated the mass by looking at the speeds of these galaxies, just as we did last week by calculating the mass of the sun by looking at the speed of one of its satellites, the Earth calculating the mass, he could do the same thing, a bit more complicated, but by looking at the speeds of the galaxies as they rotated in the, in the cluster, he could calculate the mass of the coma cluster, and he could calculate, of course, the luminosity of what he saw in his telescope, and he found that the mass to light ratio was way beyond 30. It was over 100. Again, more evidence that clearly there was a lot more mass here then we could see of the things that were giving off light, the stars. And if you look at the right there, that, that column, as we look at more mo modern numbers, you can see uh, that again, the sun has a mass to light ratio of one. Uh, the Milky Way, just looking at its visible part, has a mass to light ratio of 10. It's not surprising, again, there's a great black hole, right, in the middle of, uh, of the Milky Way. It does, doesn't, doesn't, has lots of mass, but gives off no light at all. By the way, right, that was the subject of the uh, Nobel Prize this week. Did you, did you guys see in the paper the Nobel Prizes were given out for physics? Half the prize was shared by two astronomers, one an American. Uh, uh, forget her name now, but uh, she and a German uh, astronomer were given half the prize for their work on our friend Sagittarius A star. 
our, our supermassive black hole um, in the center of our galaxy. But as you, as we, as you look at, at bigger and bigger structures, uh, small galaxy groups have a mass to right ratio way beyond 30, 50 to 150, more like what Zwicky had seen. And for a rich galaxy cluster, that is with lots and lots of galaxies and lots and lots of activity going on, that mass to right ratio can, can, can go up to 250 to 300. This is way beyond anything that we, the mass that's in this ratio, in the numerator of this ratio, is, you know, uh, is just not seen. Most of it is, in fact, not seen. Uh, and we'll see why we can see the mass that's not seen, why we can calculate the mass that is not seen. But there's a tremendous more amount of mass in these rich galaxies than there is light coming out from the mass that we can see. Another piece of evidence comes from when we look at the gas between the galaxies in the galaxy cluster. It's a beautiful Hubble picture here. The pink is that gas as we're looking at a galaxy cluster here. Uh, these are not stars, these are galaxies. And the gas is very, very hot. The gas is giving off X-ray radiation, uh, very powerful radiation as we know. And so that means the gas is very, very hot. Uh, and what again is surprising is when you look at the speed of that gas, gas molecules moving, what their speed must be to give off that kind of X-ray radiation, that gas should have dissipated long ago. There's no way that the amount of gravitational strength that we see in the, in the galaxies that we see can hold that fast moving gas. Just as, for example, there's no uh, atmosphere on the moon. The moon has lost its atmosphere billions of years ago because the gravitational strength of the moon is so small that whatever gas molecules were on the moon have long dissipated uh, and gone, and there's no atmosphere on the moon. This gas should have dissipated long ago. If you look at the gravitational strength of the galaxy from the mass that we can see, what you're looking at in that purple around is the dark matter. Again, we'll talk about how we can see that dark matter, how we can calculate that dark matter, how we can make a picture of, of that dark matter, uh, because it cannot be seen in the telescope. This obviously is colored. The, the Hubble picture is colored. The ga gas is also not pink. These are colors that we use so that we can, as humans, make sense of what we're looking at. But the, but, the, but the purple, the, the blue around the outside is the dark matter, which is holding that gas together, creating that stronger gravitational field. And that's the reason why this gas is not dissipated. The only explanation uh, of why that gas uh, is still there. But the real discovery, what put dark matter on a map, which, which convinced the, 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 the skeptics, and there were many skeptics in astronomy, of this dark matter. Certainly they agreed that something was strange, um, but what really uh, uh, convinced uh, the astronomical world that dark matter was real and uh, had to be contended with and had to be studied seriously was the work of, of Vera Rubin. And what she did was she studied spiral galaxies. She began with the Andromeda galaxy, our closest spiral galaxy to us, and she was interested in the rotation of spiral galaxies. All spiral galaxies rotate. That's in fact one reason why they have this spiral structure. And she was interested in the speeds from the inside and moving out. How fast were the stars and the gas on the outside moving as you went further and further out on the spiral galaxy? <clears throat> she had certain expectations of what that speed should be. And so she went about to, to measure as many galaxies as she could. Uh, the speed of the inner stars moving out, stars uh, getting you know less and less dense until finally going out to the outside structure where there was very little stars, but still there's lots of gas out there. And uh, using the Doppler shift, both for stars, the spectra for stars, and the Doppler shift looking at the spectra of the gas. Yeah, even cool gas will give off some radiation. Even cool hydrogen gas will give off radiation in the radio wavelength and the Doppler shift can, can be measured. And so she could um, map what the speed of the matter in, in the galaxy was 
as the radius get, got larger and larger. And this is what she found. This is the data that she found. She found that the speed did increase for a while, which was expected, but it continued to increase. The speed kind of flattened out, yes, but it did either go up very gently or, or flatten out. This was very strange. This was not what she expected. What she expected was this. She expected the dotted line. She expected that the speeds that she would measure as, the, as she went further and further out on the, on the spiral galaxy would begin to get lower and lower and lower. Why did she think this? Well, let's go back to last week's uh, wonderful slide that we all know and love of when we calculated the mass of the sun. Remember, we had this very important formula where this here represents the force that you need for something to move in a circle. And this is the force that's providing that motion in the circle, the gravitational force. They must be the same and we're able to solve for the central uh, mass uh, that was creating that gravitational force to make the satellite move in a circle. And we use this formula to go ahead and calculate one solar mass. Okay, that's what we did last week. Well, by the magic of algebra, we of course can solve the equation for any variable we like. And let's go ahead and solve uh, for the velocity. If we know the mass of the central body and we know how far out the satellite is, uh, R, then we can calculate what the velocity should be of that satellite. Instead of calculating the central mass, if we knew the central mass, we could go ahead and calculate the anticipated velocity uh, depending on how far out you are. This is what she was anticipating. She was anticipating this formula. Now, if you look at the solar system, if you look at the mass of the solar system as you go further and further out, we know that 99% of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. So once you go beyond the sun, your, your, your mass is more or less constant. You get this tiny blip at Jupiter <laughs> and Saturn, but otherwise the mass is essentially the same. So the mass is not changing, but the radius, of course, is continuing to grow as we go out to, to the various planets. So R is getting bigger and bigger in the denominator, and you would expect with the mass staying the same, G, of course, doesn't stay the same. G is Newton's universal gravitational constant. So with the numerator staying essentially the same for the solar system and only R growing larger and larger, you would expect, according to mathematics, the velocity will go down as the denominator gets bigger and bigger. And um, that motion is called a Keplerian motion for, for Kepler, who found the three laws of, uh, of celestial uh, motion mechanics. And so as the, as the distance out from the central body gets larger and larger, you expect that velocity to decrease if the mass is not increasing, if the mass is more or less stable. And that's just what we see with the planets. Okay? The planets certainly have a Keplerian motion. If you look at the speed of Mercury at 48 kilometers per second, going all the way down to Neptune of just five kilometers per second. It is following that Keplerian motion uh, <clears throat> because um, we're going out further and further with R and the mass that's making these speeds is not appreciably increasing at all. That's why she expected this curve. She expected the same thing because the gas of the outside part of the spiral galaxy is not anywhere near as much massive as the actual stars inside. That mass was growing, but very, 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 very slowly and not enough to keep up uh, by to, to continue to have this velocity increase over and over. She expected that the graph would, 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 we would see is this one over R squared kind of graph. As R got bigger and bigger, one over R squared got smaller and smaller, the measure of the velocity. So this is not what she saw, she saw this. How is this to be explained? How is that V, here's V, <coughs> GM over R, how is V either flat, not, not going down at all, or even slightly increasing? Well, we know R is increasing. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We're going out at further and further R's to see these velocities. If this is flat or increasing, then M must be increasing. It's the only explanation in this formula to keep this thing either flat or slightly increasing, is for M must be to be increasing along with R. But yet, 
although M is increasing, we don't see this mass. Yes, we see the mass of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the gas as we are increasing, but that mass of that gas is not keeping up with the necessary mass that you need to create this graph. And this pretty much is the definitive first proof that convinced the astronomical world. Vera Rubin's uh, research convinced her that this dark matter was not just something about the coma cluster or anything like that. This was very real. This was seen right in an individual galaxy. Also, this matter, this dark matter that was creating this kind of phenomenon uh, of, of keeping the speeds of the outside part of the galaxies so fast, did not have any other effect, apparently, on the galaxy. It didn't have any effect on the radiation or any other processes that we could see in the galaxy except for this gravitational effect of the, of the greater orbital speeds. <clears throat> Uh, to look at the last piece of, uh, of our evidence of dark matter, we need to look at the theory of relativity. We knew we would need this at some point. In fact, we need this quite a bit. Um, uh, but before we, before we get into relativity, let me just mention a little bit of the backstory of Vera Rubin. Interesting story. Uh, graduated from universities. Her education was in the 50s. And you can imagine what life for a woman astronomer was in the 50s. Uh, she was an incredible minority uh, in, in those days. And she went to Vassar. She was the only graduate of Vassar that, that year that majored in astronomy, her undergraduate degree. Um, she then applied to Princeton. Uh, and instead of getting a catalog for graduate school astronomy in Princeton, she got a letter from Princeton saying that we don't accept uh, women uh, appl applicants for, for, for astronomy at Princeton. Yeah, this was true until 1975, if you can believe it, that women were not accepted as graduate students in the Princeton astronomy program. So she went to Cornell and uh, got an excellent education and went and studied under very famous people like Feynman uh, and Beta, uh, two very important uh, figures in the, in, the, uh, in the Manhattan Project, build, building the atomic bomb. She got a first class education uh, at Cornell, married, married a, a physicist at Cornell, and uh, he got a job at John Hopkins down in the Washington DC area. Um, so she went ahead and finished her PhD down uh, in Washington DC area. She uh, went to Georgetown. Now Georgetown may not sound like uh, a center of research for astronomy, but in fact who was teaching there and who became her graduate thesis advisor was George Gamow, who we will hear a lot about George Gamow, very instrumental in developing the theory of the Big Bang. So in fact, she got a first class education despite Princeton not, uh, not wanting to accept her into, into their program. And in fact, her, the her thesis, her PhD thesis, was remember where we left the story of the distribution of galaxies back in the 50s? Walter Bade had shown that the galaxies looked, seemed to be more or less distributed evenly from what he could see using uh, the 100 inch uh, uh, telescope up in Mount Wilson. Uh, here a little bit later on here, uh, what she was able to do with, with her facilities was to show in fact, no, it seemed like the galaxies actually had more of a clustering effect. They seemed to come more in clusters this thesis coming from a graduate student was looked upon with skepticism. Uh, it was a, a, a new idea that was just developing, the cluster idea, but she was in fact one of the people who began to develop the, uh, the empirical evidence uh, that galaxies in fact were coming across, uh, were, were actually clumping uh, in clusters. Okay, before we start uh, uh, relativity, I wanted to ask uh, Greg, Greg, uh, well, I'm sorry, even before Greg, if you take a look at, at the chat um, uh, box, you'll see that I put up a, uh, uh, a website there of Jeff Newcomer. He's one of our students. Jeff is hopefully is, is here today. But when Jeff saw my, um, my uh, photographs that I showed of the Milky Way in the beginning of last week's uh, presentation, he very kindly and to my great surprise sent me his blog. Uh, he is an incredible astrophotographer. 
Jeff does just remarkably beautiful work. I was just blown away. I wish I had known before the class I would have used his pictures instead of the pictures that I found off of the web. So I wanted to post his blog there uh, on the um, uh, on the chat box. I don't know if you can cut and paste out of the out of the chat box. I don't know if you can do that, but I will post that blog again in next Wednesday's um, in, in next Wednesday's uh, email. Uh, in case you can't pick it up from from the chat box, you know, the, the pictures that are in there, you you can uh, you can uh, copy. Um, I'm sorry, the pictures what? Pictures that are in the blog, you can you can uh, save. Uh, they are lower resolution and watermarks, so you can save and use them. Well, I don't know. On my computer, they were just beautiful, and I thought maybe some some people would like to go out to your blog and and look at your work. I hope that's okay that I posted the blog. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the first item in the chat box. Um, uh, uh, Greg, do we have anything else? Any questions outstanding right now? Um, yes, we have uh, a question and a comment. A question from Sharon Beatty. Does the ratio use apparent luminosity or absolute? That's a very good question. In fact, both, both, can, be, both can be used, but generally it would be the absolute uh, uh, luminosity that's being used because we've got on the one hand the absolute mass we're trying to find the absolute mass of the galaxy and so we would want to use the absolute luminosity so we're comparing apples to apples and then we have a comment from Joe Parisi the notion of dark matter is predicted by clusters etc needing to have much more mass than gravitational laws would predict rather than the conclusion that there must be more unseen matter out there did any scientists conclude that the gravitational laws were wrong or incomplete? Oh, that is a great question. This, is, this has happened ever since Newton proposed <laughs> the law of gravity. People have been trying to figure out or say that, you know, maybe Newton's law is not quite right. When they have something they don't understand, one of the go-to things, as you'll see in the history of science, is that maybe the law of gravity is wrong. And we will see this again in our story when we come to dark uh, energy uh, next week. It's very, very interesting. And people keep, uh, except for the tremendous revolution of what we're gonna talk about right now, Einstein's general relativity, which has modified uh, uh, Newton's gravity, but not in its you know, gross way, not, not, not for any you know, normal calculations uh, that we do. Uh, NASA doesn't have to use uh, general relativity to put its, uh, its orbitals uh, on Mars. It can use good old Newtonian gravity. But people keep trying to say that maybe Newton's gravity is wrong, and that's why, we, why we're getting something that we don't understand. So yes, that has definitely happened. That was definitely put forward as an, as an ultimate explanation of dark matter. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at our last great piece of evidence of dark matter. Uh, coming from the general theory of relativity, and that pretty much uh, you can't fool with, uh, with 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 the laws of gravity. We have Newtonian gravity, we have Einsteinian general relativity gravity. This is what the laws of gravity are telling us: that dark matter is real, that dark matter exists. And so, no, there is no real serious uh, contention today that I know of that people are looking in the in the in the area of dark matter as to why, uh, why we should um, doubt, uh, doubt the, um, you know, the, 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 our understanding of, of gravity, as, in, as incomplete as it is. Uh, gravity is a tremendous mystery on, on one level, but it seems the laws of gravity, coming from Newton's laws and uh, Einstein's equations of general relativity, seem to be uh, well accepted uh, today to explain uh, dark, dark matter. And the, okay, and Peter, so, I don't think you can do anything about this. Um, Sharon Beatty says, I'm not seeing Peter's post. My post, I don't know what that is. My email? I'm yes. Not sure. Well, I'll, I'll chat more with her. Thank you. Yeah, okay. that's something that she can hear. She can email me ah. if they're missing something that I'm, they're not getting. Okay. <laughs> that, 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 by the way, is not surprising because I lost power on Wednesday, uh, literally a few seconds or so after I sent out the Wednesday email. 
and I, the power didn't come back on until three o'clock in the morning. But apparently most people did get the email. The email obviously got to the central server at the college and it did go out. So if someone did not get the email or anything like that, it would not surprise me that, that, that uh, there was some kind of a delivery error because I did get that power outage just <laughs> as I was completing to send, send the message out. Okay, but hopefully that didn't affect most people. General relativity. Okay, what, 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 what do we need to say about general relativity for, for, for understanding uh, of dark matter? We know that general relativity basically turns gravity into geometry. Okay? Gravity is caused not by a force, as Newton would say, but actually by the fabric of space-time is being affected by mass. And that affecting, that, that warping of space-time looks to us like a force, which creates trajectories of things moving uh, in, in, these, in these mass fields, in these gravitational fields, uh, by, the, by the warping of space-time. A very nice and very famous uh, summary of, of, of general relativity was done by John Wheeler, one of the great theoretical physicists of the 20th century, specializing in, in gravity. One of the, the time, you know, I think he's dead now, but the, probably the world expert in, in general relativity. And he's, he put it very, very well. He said, space time tells matter how to move, but matter tells space time how to curve. And kind of logically that you would put that in reverse. It's matter that creates the fabric and the warping of space-time. And what space-time is then warped by matter, that will then determine the motion of the other matter around it. That once space-time is warped, then you can go ahead and calculate the trajectories uh, of matter moving through and other properties uh, moving through and interacting with that warped space-time. An example on the right there would be the, uh, the moon moving around the earth. That is, you know, the old um, analogy, which you, you've heard, I'm sure, many, many times that you think of the space time as being kind of like a trampoline, and you put something very heavy in the trampoline, and that will, you know, depress the area, the space around the trampoline, the surface around the trampoline, and then if you threw a ball around it, it would either curve or it could even actually go around um, the trampoline a couple of times before it would fall in because of friction. The point is that the, the deforming of the trampoline would affect how something that would move near the, uh, near the heavy object that's creating that, that depression. The basic idea of, uh, uh, of, uh, of space-time being warped by, by the mass. The first proof we had, the first evidence that Einstein had for, for general relativity was the famous uh, anomaly of the precession of the, of the, uh, of the orbit of, of Mercury, called the precession of the perihelion. If you think of the orbit of Mercury going around the sun as kind of a fixed wire, and the Mercury is going around the wire in its orbit, the wire itself is rotating, as you can see there in that picture. And it was measured by astronomers, measured back way back in, in, in the 19th century, that it was it was rotating the 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 uh, they call it the, the precession of the perihelion, uh, you know the the outside um, um, part of the orbit there, as it rotated around. It rotated around very slowly, 574 arc seconds per century. That's pretty slow. Um, you know, remember there are 3,600 arc seconds in a whole degree. Uh, so this is about one-seventh of a degree in a century. But this could be picked up by the astronomers of the day. And uh, looking at Newtonian theory, uh, looking at the planets that would cause this kind of perturbation of, of Mercury, uh, only 531 arc seconds could be accounted for by Newtonian theory. In 1915, uh, uh, Einstein's, uh, Einstein's new equations, the first thing he was able to derive was that additional 43 arc seconds. He says in his, uh, someplace in his writings that when he proved this in his room in Berlin uh, in 1915, he was so excited that he had heart palpitations. He was so excited, he walked the streets of Berlin for two days, not being able to sleep, just with the euphoria that his equations could predict this anomaly that, uh, that, 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 that no one else um, could do. 
that he knew that his theory uh, was uh, had to be correct. So this is the first piece of evidence, piece of theoretical kind of evidence, something that we know. Where does relativity come from? Where does this incredibly complex theory with its very, very fancy mathematics using Riemannian geometry and <clears throat> warp space, and where does this all come from? It comes from a very simple, amazingly simple idea. He called it the, 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 the happiest idea of his whole life. Uh, he was sitting way back in 1907, but still back in the, uh, in the patent office, uh, <clears throat> thinking about gravity and, 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 and such things with <laughs> Einstein thought about while he, uh, you know, while he was supposed to be working on, on, on patent approvals. <clears throat> and he saw a, a, a workman outside uh, washing windows <clears throat> on a scaffolding, you know, outside, uh, outside of the windows. And it occurred to him, this is what he says, that if he fell off the scaffolding, and as he fell, he would not sense his own weight. He would not feel his own weight. To him, as he fell, <laughs> he would be weightless. And this is the idea that he claims sparked his whole train of thought and the 10 years of work and the fancy mathematics that he had to uh, master with help from some of his mathematical buddies from, from, from his college days to, to develop the theory of general relativity. And the picture on the left kind of shows uh, the idea. It's called the principle of equivalence is what he saw in that work when falling down. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of the, the opposite of not having any weight. That what weight is, what, 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 what gravity is, is something that's created by mass and if you stand on the earth, the earth will pull you down and you'll feel the force. Uh, uh, that's why I ask people to mute themselves. <laughs> uh, so standing on the earth, you'll be in a gravitational field and you will feel pulled down. Einstein said, if, you, if we put you out in space, okay, in a rocket ship, and sent you up with, with an acceleration equivalent to the acceleration that you would have if you fell by dropping something on the earth, you would feel exactly the same kind of gravitational pull down. You will be pushed down to the bottom of the rocket ship exactly the same way just by simply accelerating you up. They are equivalent. And there is no experiment that you could do if you were in a closed box on the earth and a closed box inside the spaceship but you had any instrument you had, any, any lab instrument in physics that you had, you had the most elaborate physics laboratory in the world in that box with you. There is no experiment that you could do that you could tell whether you were standing on the earth, stationary, being pulled down by this mass, or if you were being accelerated in empty space with no mass around you at all, but simply accelerated at, at, at the rate of 9.8 meters per second faster every second. This is the principle of equivalence. And as strange as it seems, this is what put him on the road to, uh, to, to, to the complex, beautiful theory of general relativity. An immediate consequence that we can see is if we were in one of those two boxes, if you were in the accelerating box and we've shown a, light, a beam of light across the room that you were in, if you truly were accelerating up, not moving at a constant speed, but accelerating up, going faster and faster, that beam would bend down, right? Because you were moving up faster and faster. The beam to you would look like it was bending down. Well, according to the principle of equivalence, that same thing would happen if you were standing on the earth clearly so small that there's no way that you could measure it, not even with our modern technology today, could we measure the deviation of that light from going across um, uh, uh, a room because of the gravitational uh, pull of the earth. But theoretically, according to this principle of equivalence, that, that gravity should bend light just the way moving up in acceleration would bend the path of light. And that is the fundamental idea on the right-hand side that gravity should bend light. That consequence of the principle of equivalence is what will lead us to, um, to well, the next set of ideas, including uh, how we can, again, have more evidence of, of dark matter. And so here is the famous uh, uh, evidence of 1919, where uh, uh, um, Sir Arthur Eddington 
the great uh, astronomer in, in, in Britain, went ahead and did a, an, a, 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 a exhibition, uh, a expedition uh, out to catch uh, the, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the uh, eclipse uh, of, the, of the sun uh, by the moon that would darken out the sun so we could see the stars behind the sun. <clears throat> and the idea was that the stars coming very close to the rim of the sun that we could finally see because of the eclipse should be slightly off center, should be moved from, from where they knew, we know they really are. And the picture there on the left is what's showing that. The light from the star, if it moves very, very close to the rim of the sun will be bent just as the principal equivalence uh, demands. But we always look at light that it moves in straight lines. We always see light moving in straight lines. So if the light was coming from this direction, we would see it coming from this direction here. And this is the famous picture that Eddington brought back to show one picture is the position of the star before the eclipse uh, on any given night where the star would be. Uh, and this is the picture of where it was modified, moved, apparently moved because of, the, uh, of, the, of its motion moving close to the sun. And this was confirmed, this was decided after great analysis that this in fact was what Einstein had predicted. Uh, he had a numerical prediction of, uh, of 1.7 arc seconds is what he said a star's deviation just moving right from the rim would be, it would be off its true position by 1.7 arc seconds and Eddington pronounced that that was close enough, uh, that this was the first empirical uh, prediction that was then uh, proven by, by, by general relativity. There's even a formula that uh, is in general relativity which can calculate that angle. It involves G, of course, the gravitational constant. Here's the mass of the sun, and here's the speed of light squared, and here's the radius of the sun, okay? So this is what would, would, would calculate uh, the, um, uh, what, what, what that angle would be. Interesting side story about this, about this equation. Uh, Einstein, in a sense, was very lucky. Back in uh, 1913, when the theory was just coming together but not fully formed, his equation for this kind of uh, a deviation had a two in it instead of a four. It turns out there was a young German astronomer, a big fan of Einstein, had been following his work, followed his papers on special relativity and his work coming out on this stuff and on, on quantum mechanics. Big, big fan of, of Einstein. And uh, he wanted to help out, help Einstein any way he could, this young German astronomer. And Einstein asked him, could you go ahead and do this eclipse experiment? Could you see if uh, this in fact will happen? And he went ahead and did it. He had the wherewithal to have the equipment. Uh, an eclipse was coming up in 1914 and he was gonna go off to the eclipse site where total, where, where, where total uh, darkness was and he was gonna go ahead and measure the angle. But the angle, was not 1.7, but only about 0.8 arc seconds, which is what Einstein's prediction was at the time. There was a two, a two there instead of a four. It was only half the thing. Well, it turns out that World War I broke out. And as a German national, he, he went to some part of Russia, some part of Siberia, where he would get totality of the eclipse so that he would get the complete dark sky to see the stars behind it. As a German national, <laughs> He was arrested. He and his whole crew were arrested uh, by, by, by the Russian government <clears throat> as a you know, combatant. World War II broke out. World War I broke out. All of his equipment was confiscated. They were held uh, in Russia during the, uh, during, during the war. They were finally released at some point and <laughs> allowed to go home. They, uh, but they were held you know, initially as spies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so he was never able to make that measurement. And historians of science say was very, very lucky that <laughs> he wasn't, because he would have, if he had made a good measurement uh, and gotten the 1.7 and Einstein's predicting 0.8, you know, who knows what that could have done to the whole taking the air out of out of the theory of general relativity, could have taken the air out of Einstein for all we know that that, that maybe something was fundamentally wrong and could have delayed the whole process of developing the theory. So that, that never did happen. Einstein never did get a bad measurement, <laughs> and uh, and so that's that's the story of the uh, of the 1.7 arc seconds. 
So again, space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve. The more matter, the greater the warping, the greater the, what we would look at as the gravitational field, what appears to us as the stronger and stronger gravitational force. And here on the left are some pictures of that. The sun would cause a certain amount of, of uh, depression in the space-time fabric, a white dwarf, which is a, a very heavy star that we'll talk about uh, next time. Um, has the a typical white dwarf can have the mass of the sun, but only the size of the earth. So you can imagine the incredible density of the mass of the sun, but only the size of the earth. And a neutron star, which is the second most massive thing in the universe, only thing greater would be a black hole. A neutron star, uh, one typical measure could be the mass of the sun and it's often uh, called the size of Manhattan Island. So an incredibly dense, uh, most dense object you can have before you get into a, a, a black hole. So the distortion gets greater and greater and greater. <clears throat> and the idea uh, is that one way to measure the gravitational strength of an object is to see what it takes to leave that gravitational field. What kind of speed do you need to send something off from its surface that it won't come back? The so-called escape velocity. That is a, a very nice measure of what the um, of what the gravitational force, the gravitational field that the body is creating. And not surprising, the more mass, the greater the, the escape velocity you need uh, to get away from the gravitational field. There's a, some values there. The moon has 2.4 kilometers per second. If you want to shoot something off from the earth for not to come back, if you want a cannon for a shell <clears throat> that you shoot off, theoretically, if there's no atmosphere, <laughs> uh, you'd have to shoot it off at 11 uh, kilometers per second. It would not come back. That would not be true uh, in, in the real earth because of all the friction of the air. But the 2.4 kilometers per second is a real number for the moon because it has no atmosphere. It would not come back if you shot off something at that speed. Something even heavier, Jupiter, be 60 kilometers per second and on and on and on. So it would be a measure of the strength of the gravitational field. Well, what happens if you're talking about a white dwarf? What happens if you're talking about a neutron star? What kind of escape velocity would you need for, 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 for something to not come back? What happens when the calculation shows you that the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light and nothing can move faster than light, not even light. <laughs> what happens, and since E is equal to mc squared and matter and energy are equivalent, and we have the equivalence principle, what happens even to light when the escape velocity of the gravitational field is greater than the speed of light? Even light cannot escape from that gravitational field. That's a black hole. Right? And so that's one of the great consequences of the, of the general theory of relativity, the existence of black holes. Einstein, by the way, recognized this, uh, but never thought it would become any you know, significant physically. He never thought there would ever be real amount of mass that would actually accumulate to be something of any significance, uh, to be a real black hole in some kind of you know, real sense, some astronomical sense that would affect you know, the science of astronomy. He thought it was more of a theoretical idea, theoretically true, but one, one, one would never see such a thing. Uh, he didn't take his own idea all that seriously in terms of how it affect the real world. So here's the anatomy of a black hole. We're not gonna look at black holes as such. Uh, to, uh, to the study of cosmology, the black hole itself is not of great interest. It's what it can produce. It can produce some of the brightest objects in the universe. It can spread out, send out uh, radiation, which sounds a little uh, ironic, that black hole, which nothing can, can, can uh, move out from, can produce tremendous amounts of energy, tremendous amounts of radiation, uh, both you know, pure matter, pure radiation, and also cosmic particles, matter coming out. Uh, and it can do that through the motion uh, of the matter in the accretion disk. But just looking at the, uh, at the anatomy of a black hole, here's again that picture of the gravitational field. Now, instead of having a tremendous mass down here of some size, now you have what we call a singularity. The mass is real. There's a certain amount of mass there at that point. Could be one solar mass, could be, you know, 
uh, a billion solar masses uh, for a supermassive black hole, but the volume is zero. That is, the gravitational fields become so strong that it's shrunk down to a volume of zero. And so your density would be mass over volume. You've got volume zero in the denominator. You can't have that in mathematics. That's called infinity. And so what physicists call it is a singularity. It's something which, you know, that's what it is. <laughs> it's something of zero volume, uh, but it has mass. And so that creates a area around it called the, the, the event horizon that anything within that event horizon has an escape velocity greater than the speed of light. And the event horizon obviously depends upon how massive the black hole is. The more massive, the bigger the uh, event horizon would be. Once you get beyond the event horizon, that's where you have the accretion disk. That is the gas that is revolving around the black hole and very, very slowly will be falling into it falling into a point of no return. So in this picture here, this black thing here, this is not the black hole, right? This is the event horizon. This is the place where you can't get anything out of, and that's why it's depicted as black. Going around it is the accretion disk, uh, and it's as big as this, you know, proportional to the size of the black hole. Um, and uh, the other thing which is important to us is this jet here this amount of energy that can be produced to send out from the black hole. And this can produce some of the greatest, you know, ejections of energy, productions of energy in the universe. And as cosmologists, we are interested in very, very bright things. We are interested in anything which produces a tremendous amount of energy. Why? Because if it's very, very bright, we can see it from very, very far away. And if we can see something which is very, very far away, we're looking at it very, very far back in time. And that's why we're interested in bright objects, because we can see things which those bright objects, which are so far away, are back billions, possibly billions of years uh, when what we're looking at was where they, what they were billions of years ago. That's why black holes are of interest um, to us in the study of, of cosmology. Okay, so here's an example, a depiction, artistic depiction of creating one of those incredible, incredible uh, energy sources called a quasar. Again, we have the accretion disk there going surrounding or going around the black hole. And if the black hole is near a star, which can, it can suck because of its gravitational field, can suck matter from that star and build the accretion disk greater and greater, getting hotter and hotter, uh, what we find is that uh, that interaction of the accretion disk with the event horizon can create these incredible bursts of energy. And they actually are directed like this. They become like a funnel like this. So if we happen to be in the way of that funnel, <laughs> if that funnel happens to be pointed towards us, and since there are trillions of stars, right, and billions and billions of galaxies, there are a lot of black holes. And there, some of them could be pointing towards us. Those quasars we will see from five, eight, 10 billion light years away. And those objects are of great interest to us, as we'll see. So, <clears throat> why we're interested in black holes and what they can do for us. If you're interested in black holes, I know that Claudio has had many courses where he's talked about black holes. He's probably spent uh, many lectures talking about black holes. A very important topic in, in modern astronomy, but not in, in, in and of itself for the study of cosmology. Okay, the famous picture of 2017, where there was a picture in the news, the picture in the newspapers, pictures on six o'clock news of a black hole. Okay, and this is that picture coming from our friend M87. Remember we had M87, we had this very picture up here, where uh, again, that tremendous amount of energy, both cosmic rays and also uh, electromagnetic energy was coming out of the center of the great elliptical galaxy M87. Um, and it's in that galaxy that in 2017, the Event Horizon Telescope was able to take this incredible picture uh, down in the lower right-hand corner. 
This is not a picture of a black hole. By definition, there is no picture of a black hole. It's a picture of the accretion disk. That is the full accretion disk. And what's in the center is the event horizon. And what's in the center of the, the dark area of the center horizon would be the singularity, would be that incredible massive object. And then when, when I say incredible, truly incredible, it's two to three billion uh, solar masses uh, is what uh, is calculated to be inside the center of, of M87. You can see how big it is. Look, look at the event horizon. That's the orbit of Pluto, for goodness sake, in here. So this is what an accretion disk uh, could look like for a very, very large black hole. Okay, so that's black holes from the bending of light. That's one consequence. For us, for dark matter, to finish our story, we have what's called gravitational lensing and was first discovered in 1979, looking at a quasar of all things, looking at something very, very far away, tremendous distance, many billions of light years away. And what astronomers saw was two quasars, very close together, just six arc seconds apart. But what was interesting about them, they were identical. They had the same redshift, they had the same spectra, <laughs> this is not, they were so close together, this can't be a coincidence, they were the same object. We were looking at two copies of the same object in the sky. It was being duplicated. How can that be? <laughs> how does that happen? Uh, and this is how it happens. <laughs> it happens through what's called gravitational lensing. Here is a source of light, it could be a galaxy, it could be the quasar, and if that source of light is going through a tremendous gravitational field, uh, like a galaxy, or more likely a galaxy cluster, that light will be bent and warped. Just as we know, light is changed, is warped, is bent by the gravitational field because it's following the warping of the space-time created by the gravitational field, created by the mass. And it acts literally like a lens. It will literally bend the light and we, of course, always see light coming from straight lines. Okay, that's how we see light, when we see the direction of light. And so we see two separate images. If we're lucky, we can actually see the original image as well. Uh, if it's not being, you know, the dust and, uh, and whatever of the cluster itself is not blocking it. But here you can see these two images, not what was going on. Okay. Here's a beautiful picture uh, of, a, of a distortion with the front uh, lights that you see are galaxies in the cluster. And these little arcs here, you see there's a red arc here, there's an arc here. These distortions, these are, this is a picture of a galaxy cluster much further back than the galaxy cluster that's in front of us. And so the light coming from those galaxies, from the galaxy cluster much further back are being distorted by this gravitational lensing uh, effect. And uh, this was studied uh, starting in great earnest in the 80s. Uh, and um, all kinds of wonderful things were shown. Um, for example, here's a pretty picture of what's called an Einstein ring. Here we have a star or some kind of a light source that's almost directly behind that particular uh, galaxy, almost directly behind it. And so the light that's being bent is being bent in all directions coming around it, you know, full circle, you know, uh, light from every single direction is being bent in. And so it looks to us like a circle. And Einstein predicted this uh, uh, could happen. He thought of it as a star behind another star, uh, which would be almost impossible to line up that way. The star wouldn't be bright enough. This, I think, more is a, gal a galaxy lined up with a, a galaxy that is doing that. So you get these incredible effects. Here's a cute one uh, of here's a couple of, here's another galaxy cluster. Here are two galaxies, which are in the cluster, cl the close galaxy, these two galaxies are moving towards each other and creating a tremendous amount of heat and energy. Again, we have the X-ray uh, light being given off by the gas between the two galaxies as they move closer and closer together, creating tremendous amount of friction and energy. And here are these arcs. This is a galaxy cluster behind this one being subject to the, to the gravitational lensing. You get all these very, very weird, uh, weird effects. It's called a Cheshire Cat Galaxy Group. 
the one that's doing the uh, lensing. But this lensing can be done not only in visible light, it can also be done in any other kind of light, for example, in X-ray light. And here's a picture from the Cassandra X-ray telescope where we have a source of light, a single source of light uh, giving off X-ray light. <clears throat> and uh, it goes through a galaxy or a galaxy cluster. You get that bending going on. And as we follow the light back, as the telescope follows the light back from these different paths, we see the source in, in different places, multiple places. And this is literally a picture of, again, color coded so that we can see it uh, of the X-ray light uh, photographed by the, uh, by, by the telescope. Okay, so what does that have to do with, 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 with dark matter? Well, <clears throat> as we look at this, these multiple images of, of light, we can calculate according to the, the you know, general relativity, what kind of mass would have to be here to create this kind of bending? Yeah, tremendous amount of work has been done. Tremendous amount of sophisticated mathematics has been worked. New mathematics has been worked uh, to figure out what kind of mass is creating this kind of lensing. How much of the warping of space time do you have to have to see these kind of images precisely this way, coming from this kind of source? And you can map, you can map the distribution of matter that's creating this kind of warping. And then you can compare that distribution of matter that you need compared to the distribution of matter that you see. The distribution of matter that you see are the galaxies in the galaxy cluster, and it just doesn't add up. General relativity is demanding a certain amount of warping of space time, and the amount of matter that we see cannot create that amount of warping. What's left, what's creating the warping, what's creating the additional strength of the gravitational field is the dark matter. And here, this picture here of the, of the bullet cluster, you'll see this in any discussion if you read any popular uh, work on dark matter, even I think some of the videos that I've recommended that you take a look at, talk about this picture of the bullet cluster. It is absolutely a, a fascinating thing. What you're looking at here, guys, is two galaxy clusters who have already interacted with each other. They've already gone through each other, right? This would take millions of years uh, to happen. We don't watch this in real time, of course. <clears throat> so the galaxy cluster on the, uh, on, on the left used to be on the right and vice versa. They've already moved through each other. Again, the pink is the very, very hot gas that's, that's creating X-ray light coming out of it. And you can see the, 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 uh, you know, the shock wave, the traditional shock wave of this gas as it moved through this gas. Moving through the friction, it actually developed, formed into a shock wave kind of pattern. Okay. Now that makes sense for the gas. The, when the gases interact, they're gonna interact with each other. Okay. Uh, the gravitational effect of the gas, the friction, the heat, the, the, the radiation coming out of the gas will all interact to create this kind of, of, a, of a distortion of the gas. The stars, not at all. The stars in the galaxy cluster are very small. They actually don't interact very much at all. You'll get one collision, you know, or one interaction out of a billion, you know, each. The stars basically move through each other uh, more or less uh, un, un, unfazed. It's the gas which is so incredibly warped. The blue is the dark matter. We calculate the dark matter by looking at the warping that it's this galaxy, these two galaxy clusters are creating from objects further back. That's how we know how to map the blue. And the amazing thing, the significant thing that you're looking at, the blue has acted just like the stars. They have not been warped. They are just what they would have looked like before the collision, just as the stars look. The dark matter is not interacting in any way except gravitationally. And this is one of the strongest, most powerful proofs of dark matter. And the fact that it does not interact in any way because there's so much going on here with this hot gas and the radiation and the heat 
that's coming out of this interaction. They, uh, I, I, this is trying to picture the day. Uh, I think it says here, this is the most energetic single reaction in the universe that we know of since the Big Bang. But yet the matter and the dark matter have not been affected by this, only the gas. Um, so this is, this is the famous bullet cluster picture and I've tried to explain it uh, uh, as best I can. Okay, just finishing up quickly, here's another galaxy cluster. We see this wonderful warping going on of the, of the light sources, the galaxies, quasars, whatever behind it. And what we can do is we can, from this kind of warping and from the mass that we see, we can calculate the mass which is missing. And the mass which is missing here is in blue. The deeper blue would show, you know, greater concentrations, greater density of this, of this mass. This mass is not seen. But it's the mass that's required to get this kind of warping. It's the same story over and over again. This is the dark matter. And we are, and astronomers have become quite adept at calculating in pretty good detail to their satisfaction what the distribution of dark matter must be to create this, these kinds of, of visual effects. So bottom line is that there is more dark matter than ordinary matter. When these calculations are done again and again and again, and you find out how much dark matter you need, it's not like the same amount or one third of the amount. You need, you need five times as much dark matter to create this kind of warping that we see than the matter that we have. Sometimes it's 10 times as much. There's a, there seems to be so much more dark matter in the universe than there is regular matter. And we don't know what this is. The only way it interacts, the only way it shows itself is through the force, its force of gravity. It is mass, therefore it is matter, because it has gravity, but it doesn't seem to be electromagnetic radiation at all. So that is, um, that is, that is where we are here with the, with the notion of, of dark matter. And uh, when you sum it all up, what we find when you, do the, when, you, when you do the accounting of it, when you look at all the matter in the universe, about 84%, 85% is dark matter. And the other 16% is the matter that we know, okay, the atoms in all its different forms, electrons, protons, <clears throat> neutrons, quarks, anything, gas, okay? The matter that we know, the matter that we studied in physics and chemistry in high school, it's only 16% of the matter of the universe. The rest of it is this dark matter, okay? Um, what's, in, uh, what's in the non-luminous matter here, this bigger piece, which is interesting in itself, is that gas, that mostly that inter intergalactic gas of hydrogen. There's much more intergalactic gas of hydrogen in between the galaxies and the clusters in terms of mass, than all the stars that we know, all the trillions of stars. That's only the 2.5%. Most of the normal mass of the universe is in this non-luminous uh, gas. Throw in some black holes, throw in some uh, dim stars, but most of it is actually this intergalactic gas that pervades the entire universe, even in the voids. Okay? So there's a lot of mass in this 13.5%. This is all normal stuff. This is mostly hydrogen gas. This is everything else. This is us. These are the stars and the planets and, and everything else. So when you look at a picture like this to finish up, we know this. This is the these are the filaments and the walls and the voids, right? This is how we're, we're, we're looking at one of those simulations of, uh, of of the galaxy clusters. No, you're not. What you're looking at is a simulation of the dark matter distribution. We go back to the Big Bang theory, where dark matter has to be there. Okay, it's most of the matter of the universe. And if you simulate how dark matter has grown over over the billions of years through these powerful simulations, which of course we'll be talking about once we get to the Big Bang theory, this is what we find. We find exactly the same structure that we see in the galaxies of stars and galaxies. Okay? But this is the stuff. That's, this is the scaffolding. This is what came first. It's the dark matter, which is what allows the structure to form so that the galaxies and the stars, they just kind of hang off of it. <laughs> it's the dark matter which is creating the structure that we saw last week. 
How do we know that? Because the dark matter doesn't interact with any kind of radiation, it has the ability to clump faster than the regular matter. The regular matter is mostly hot gas, right, at the beginning. Okay, it's flying up all over the place. It's going to take a long time for that regular matter, that very, very hot gas to coagulate into stars. The dark matter is not that way. The dark matter doesn't interact that way. It can clump much, much more quickly. It can create its structure. Those structures can develop much sooner. And once those structures are created, ah, then the hot gas, the stuff that we know and love, has a structure to begin to glom onto. And that's why it is the dark matter that creates the structure of the universe, not the regular matter. And so one last picture. Uh, this is from astronomy picture of the day. Uh, this is a simulation with the dark matter structure and the actual matter uh, that can glom onto it. So this is a, a simulation from one of those supercomputer simulations uh, of the web, the filaments, the voids, but these are in dark matter. And the little yellow, little dots, that's us. <laughs> those are the superclusters of matter. That's the comparison of the amount of dark matter in the universe compared to the regular matter. So, uh, so, so there, there we have it, guys. Um, let me open up. Uh, Greg, can you uh, tell us what's going on in terms of questions? It looks like we have no questions. Okay. Oh no, no there's one. I must. Oh, there's one. I must be doing a good Is... job then explaining things. Any anybody have a question verbally? Uh, I've got one question. Oh, okay. Uh, there's one question: Is dark matter antimatter? No, dark matter is not antimatter. Uh, matter of fact, there is no substantial antimatter in the in the universe. In general, as a theory, since we know all matter has an antimatter co uh, component made to it, when you create matter out of pure energy, you're always making a piece of matter and antimatter. The same thing presumably would be the case for dark matter, but we don't see any real antimatter in the universe. Okay, we only see it in the lab, and it lasts for you know. A, a, a trillionth of a second, then it's gone. It, it hits a piece of matter and, and, and they, uh, uh, you know, they just evaporate each other in an explosion of, of, a, of a gamma ray. So there is no antimatter that we see in the universe. And there may be antimatter in, in dark matter, but that's gone as well. So somehow or other, and we'll talk about this more, somehow or other when matter and antimatter was made, there was more matter than antimatter, thank goodness, uh, and the antimatter all kind of got disintegrated with this, its matter counterpart, and there was some matter left over. So astronomers can only hypothesize that the same thing happened with dark matter. So since we know so little about dark matter, we have no handle on it at all. We just presume that there could be antimatter dark matter, but it is not anything like the antimatter of regular matter, okay? And luckily, we don't see any antimatter uh, in the universe. We, there, there are no antimatter galaxies. There are no antimatter stars that astronomers um, see. Um, but no, dark matter is something very, very different than antimatter. <clears throat> I guess the most dramatic thing that we can think about is dark matter and matter don't seem to really in, in, integrate at all, except through their gravitational uh, force. They seem to go right through each other. Okay, we're, we're surrounded by dark matter right now as we speak. It only, its only effect is to create more gravity. Antimatter <laughs> creates the biggest explosion pound for pound that we know of in physics. When matter and antimatter combine, we get pure, uh, pure energy. So they are quite different. Any other questions? Okay, guys. Well, thank you. Uh, what we'll do uh, is we'll move on to dark energy uh, next time, and we'll finish this physiology uh, of the universe. We'll then Peter, have a yes. Um, I don't think the link to uh, to some of my uh, uh, blog pages uh, showing the astrophotography came through in the chat, so I added that in at the end of the chat. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to if, if that's a different link than what I put up, is that what you're saying? You put oh, no. up the correct link? I didn't see your link in there at all. Oh, well, I'm looking at the chat box and I, I'm, I'm seeing it in front of me now, but 
Anyway, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your link and the link that you sent me, and I'm going to post it next Wednesday. Uh, so in case any, anybody who's not getting the chat going uh, <clears throat> can get out to take a look at your blog, which I think is just wonderful. Thank um, you. Okay. So next week we will look at, we'll finish off our physiology study because right matter and energy are equivalent, E is equal to MC squared. We wanna look at the totality of matter and energy in the universe. And once we have that, we're then prepared to say, okay, this is the structure of the universe. This is what the universe looks like. Now we come to the second half of cosmology after that. How did we get here? How is it that we are what we are? How is it that we see what we see? How is it that matter and energy is like this? Very surprising this, but how is it like this? That will be answered by the Big Bang. And that's where we will go starting after, after next week when we look at dark energy. Okay, guys, so if there's nothing else, what I'm gonna do is close uh, the recording and we'll end the uh, session. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I'm stopping the recording.